J.C. Ryle once said, a true Christian is one who has not only peace of conscience, but war within. He may be known by his warfare as well as by his peace. As a Christian, you were designed, created, equipped, and called to fight in a war, to engage in a spiritual battle, not against the world, of course, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, as the Apostle Paul put it in Ephesians 6, 12. In other words, you were intentionally placed by God on this earth at this specific point in time in history to make history by fighting for God's mission to save this world through the church as a member of the church, his body. So last week we talked about the difference between surrender and submission. If you were here, you remember the idea of, uh, we talked about how the idea of surrendering your life to Christ is not only not in the Bible, but it's actually an unbiblical concept altogether, which means it is vital to the success of the church and its mission that we actually stop surrendering our lives to Christ and instead submit our lives to Christ. And if that rubs you the wrong way uh, because you weren't here, go back and listen to, to that message and it'll make a lot more sense because whereas surrender is an act of resignation, submission is a call to action. Right? We talked about when a soldier surrenders, he bows down before the enemy king, lays his weapons down and says, I give up. When a soldier submits, he bows before his king, picks his weapons up and says, what are my orders? And so as believers and followers of Christ, we're never called, we're never called to surrender. On the contrary, God is calling us to fight. To fight for the lost souls in this world. To fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. To fight for our marriages. To fight for our children. To fight for our families. To fight for the gospel. To fight for the church. To fight for each other. In fact, as a follower of Christ, you should be fighting for the lives of other people just as passionately and purposefully as you fight for your own life. And not just uh, when the fight comes to you either. But we're to be on the offensive by taking that fight to our enemy. When Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus replied on this rock, meaning on this profession of faith in Christ, on this gospel, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. If you read that phrase, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it in the ancient Greek. The literal rendering of that phrase is the gates of Hades shall not withstand it. That's a very significant difference. Because when you read it the way most English translations have it, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It sounds like Jesus was saying no matter what the enemy comes at you with, he will not prevail against you. But when you read it in the original Greek, it's actually the other way around. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not withstand it. Okay, Jesus was not saying we will be able to withstand the enemy. No, he was saying the enemy will not be able to withstand us. Because his will for the church is for us to be on the offensive, not huddled up together in fear, hoping we can survive the attacks of the enemy. No, it's actually the other way around. The enemy is supposed to be running from us. Unable to withstand the onslaught of Christians who are relentlessly taking ground back from him, tearing down his strongholds and snatching lost people from the fires of hell before it's too late. Jesus was saying, don't wait for the fight to come to you. No, you take the fight right up to the gates of hell. And no matter what happens, no matter how beat up or bloodied you may be, you storm the gates of hell because there is no power in hell that can withstand the power of the church. Which makes the very next verse, the very next thing Jesus said, it makes a lot more sense. Verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Can you see the difference? It's an offensive battle strategy against our enemy. Not a defensive one. But listen, it only works when you join the fight. The ancient battle 
between the spiritual forces of darkness and the church of Jesus Christ. And of course, the enemy knows that. He's not stupid. He knows that he cannot win a head-to-head fight with the church. In fact, he's guaranteed to lose that fight every single time, which is exactly why he tries so hard to divide us, because if he can fool us into fighting each other, well, that's just as good as us surrendering to him. And that's the strategy he's been employing against the church ever since the church began, as we'll see in our story today as we finish working our way through Paul's letter to Titus, where the churches that Paul had planted across the island of Crete were turning against themselves, where infighting and division and injustice were not only commonplace, but they were threatening to destroy the local churches there, effectively taking them completely out of the fight they were meant to be fighting. And so Paul writes this letter to Titus, instructing him to travel across the island, recruiting leaders who were committed to the gospel and to each other, and then to get them ready to fight. To fight for what? To fight for the soul of the church so that the church could fight for the souls of the lost. Right? And so this last chapter of the letter is actually a call for unity and justice within the church, both then and now, to get us ready to fight the battle we were designed, created, equipped, and called to fight. Listen, not against each other, but against the gates of hell itself. So let's read it together, starting where we left off last week. Titus chapter 3, we'll begin the first 11 verses. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to avoid quarreling, to avoid quarreling, to avoid quarreling, that's the Rucci-inspired version, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. So Paul opens up this final chapter of the letter with remind them. And in the ancient Greek text, that word remind is actually in the present tense, meaning go on reminding. In other words, the church needs to be continually reminded of how God expects us to treat one another, namely out of submission to one another, which we we talked about again last week, being obedient to proper authority within the body of believers, within the church, so that we are ready for every good work, which we're going to come back to in the last part of this chapter, and to speak evil, Paul says, of no one. Well, Well, why? I mean, why shouldn't we do those things? Why shouldn't we speak evil of each other? Well, it's because we were created in the image of God. As Christians, we bear the image of Christ whose own spirit lives inside of us. And interestingly enough, that phrase to speak evil of in the the Greek is the word blasphemeo. It it means to blaspheme. This is how serious it is to God. And Paul understands that when we tear each other down in the church and we beat each other up with our words, we're actually blaspheming other Christ image bearers. And so Paul says, avoid quarreling. Because speaking evil of others is typically a result of quarrels, of course, that we have against each other, uh, other people, right? So he says, listen, even if you're convinced that you're right, and whatever it is, any other person is wrong. Uh, in fact, even if you are right, and the other person is wrong, 
Paul says avoid quarreling because of what it produces in the church, which we'll get into in just a moment. So the way to avoid quarreling, even when you're absolutely right and the other person is dead wrong, Paul says the way to avoid those quarrels is to remind yourself that you were wrong once too. Right? He says no matter how right you may be and no matter how wrong that other person may be, don't ever forget you were wrong once too. He says you were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing your days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And furthermore, it's only by the goodness and loving kindness of Christ that you can even claim to be good or right about anything at all. I mean, it's certainly uh, not by your own works that you are right or righteous or good. In other words, Paul says, listen, your response to an altar call, you realize that didn't save you, right? Saying the sinner's prayer in a church service didn't save you. Being baptized in water did not save you. Attending church did not save you. Giving in the offering did not save you. Reading the Bible did not save you. As wonderful as all of that may be, none of your works has saved you from being the wretched sinner that you once were. In fact, it is only by the grace and mercy of God that you can claim to be good or right at all. So when it comes to tearing each other down in the church, Paul says, knock it off. In fact, the word void that Paul uses in verse 9 in the Greek literally means to turn oneself about so as to face the other way. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law for they are unprofitable and they are worthless. Paul is telling Christians when it comes to fighting one another over disagreements, Turn around and walk the other way because they're unprofitable. They're worthless. Unprofitable for for what? They're unprofitable for doing what we were put on this earth to do, to take the fight to the enemy, to storm the gates of hell and take back what he's trying to steal from us. And look, the reason this is so important is because we cannot fight the enemy when we're preoccupied with fighting each other. And so Paul says, listen, Titus, this has got to be priority number one in the church. In fact, it's so important to the mission of the church that you protect the unity of the church, that if someone is sowing division, which is what happens when we tear each other down, then after warning him once and warning him twice, have nothing more to do with him. This is excommunication he's talking about. This is as serious as it gets for the early church. And listen, it's as serious as it gets for the church today, right? As members of the body of Christ, it is imperative to our purpose and our calling that we fight for unity within the church. Because you understand the church, it's not this building. It's it's not a nonprofit corporation. It's not a program or even a religion. No, the church is you and me together when we're gathered It's a sacred gathering of people who were created in the image of God, bound together by the common spirit of Christ. So you understand when you say or do something that hurts another member of that same body, you're actually hurting yourself. Whether you realize it or not, when you tear down another Christian, you're tearing down yourself because both of you are members, appendages of the same body. It's the equivalent of picking up a gun and shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, why would you do that? Jesus said if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Mark 3, 24 and 25. I think it's safe to say that we're living in a world that is divided against itself. Right? There are religious divisions, political divisions, social divisions, economic divisions, governmental divisions, moral divisions, ideological divisions. We can go on and on and on. This world is a divided place. Fact is, it always has been. And of course, you don't have to leave our borders to find all of that. We have those same divisions right here at home in America, in our own, our own communities. The truth is, we're living in an exceedingly divided society. And those kingdoms... The kingdoms of this world cannot and will not stand forever. 
The church of Jesus Christ, however, according to Jesus, the church will endure. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, he not only prophesied about us when Jesus made that statement, but he also prayed for us. Jesus prayed for you and for me in the gospel according to John. This was his prayer to the Father. He said, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they're yours. John 17, 9. You skip down to verse 20. This is the same prayer. Jesus prays. I do not ask for these only, not just these guys with me, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about you. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, that you will also be in us. So he's praying that you, his church, will be unified, will be one. In other words, no division. Why? Jesus says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I mean, do you understand what Jesus is saying here when he prays this prayer? He's saying unity in the church between you and me and you and each other. Our unity in the church validates our testimony about Jesus to the rest of the world. Please don't miss this because it is of the utmost and profound importance. Our testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the whole reason we're put here, is validated in the eyes and minds and hearts of people throughout this world based on the unity that we have within the church. Just listen to the next two verses in his prayer. He says, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. John 17, 20 through 23. Earlier in John 13, 35, Jesus says to his disciples, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. This is how the whole world is going to know that this, this thing is real, that what you say about me, Jesus, is true. That this gospel is actually valid by this. This is how it's all going to be proven. If you have love for one another. That's it. As Christians, our testimony is at the mercy of our unity. That's how important this is. Which means what our world needs, what our country needs, what our community needs, what humanity must have if there's to be any hope whatsoever of this gospel message being received by the unbelieving world around us, then the church must be united. Which is something we're going to have to fight for because unity doesn't happen on its own. It doesn't come naturally to us. You know why? Because we're human beings. We're flawed, broken, imperfect, selfish, self-centered, and at times, every one of us at times is going to offend, and at times every one of us will be offended. And so we have to fight through that. We have to fight for unity, because without unity, our testimony is worthless. Which is also why Jesus and the apostles were so harsh <laughs> toward those who sowed division in the church. Listen. Just read through the red letters in the Gospels. Read what Jesus said. It didn't matter how bad of a sinner you were, how horrible of a person, what crimes you've committed, how terrible things were in your life. He treated people with dignity and respect and honor and love and compassion and humility. Except for one group of people. When Jesus is going off on people, when he's making whips, and beating people and flipping over tables. When he's talking about putting people out of the church, kicking them out of the church and having nothing to do with them, he is always, every single time, talking about people who sow division within his church. Those are the people he had zero tolerance for. Same with the apostles. Listen, Matthew 18. Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. 
But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, in other words, once you give him every reasonable chance, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That sounds like nothing to us. This is almost cursing. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Now listen, the thrust of this entire passage is reconciliation first. That's the heart of Christ, even for these people. However, Jesus says, if the person who causes an offense against another Christian is unrepentant, in other words, unwilling to be reconciled to his or her fellow believer, even after several attempts have been made within the local church assembly, right, to, to fix this, Rather than allowing that division in the church to remain, Jesus says, treat that person as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now look, in the first century Jewish context that this was written in, Gentiles and tax collectors were the lowest of the low. They were considered worse than dogs. Outsiders, they were shunned by the rest of the community. Tax collectors were given their posts by Roman authorities through this bidding system. And, and the way the tax collectors made their personal income after collecting the taxes for Rome was by levying higher taxes than Rome actually required. And it was whatever they could set the price at and convince people to give them. So these tax collectors often made obscene profits off the backs of their own oppressed people, which is why the Jews considered them to be traitors enemies who belonged at the very lowest level of society except of course for one other group they considered to actually be lower than the tax collectors and that was the gentiles who the jews typically remained separated from altogether because the gentiles were irreparably clean as far as the jews were concerned and so gentiles and tax collectors to the jews were the outcasts right they did not belong within the jewish community this is how Jesus says the church is to treat those who intentionally and unrepentantly sow division within the church. That's why Paul says to Titus, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. In other words, treat him as a Gentile and a tax collector, knowing that such person is warped and sinfully self-condemned. We have no idea how harsh these words were. In his letter to the Corinthian church, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of this world. In other words, I'm not telling you to avoid worldly people. You'd have to leave the world to do that. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, Christian, if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. In other words, treat him like a tax collector and a Gentile. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? We don't judge the world as Christians. We're just supposed to love the world. We're not supposed to judge the world. But Paul says, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. That's not our job. But purge the evil person from among you. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. This couldn't be any more harsh. You're seeing the pattern here. Referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the apostle John wrote, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Don't even say hi, Bob. Don't even greet him. In other words, treat him like you would a tax collector and a Gentile. 2 John 1.10. I can keep going here. There are plenty of examples of this in Scripture. The point is, Jesus and his apostles after him, they didn't play around when it came to people sowing division into the church, whether it was an unresolved offense between church members, whether it was unrepentant sin, false teaching, variations on the gospel message, foolish controversies, arguments about vaccines or politics or personal preferences, anything that we allow to cause division within the church according to Jesus and the apostles is absolutely not to be tolerated. Paul says, knock it off. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. Now listen, it is perfectly fine and right, actually, to have different opinions, 
and positions and perspectives on all these things. It's fine. In fact, it's good and right to discuss and, yes, even debate those opinions and positions and perspectives. That's actually a good thing, and we should do it. That's how we learn and grow and mature together, even if we never fully agree on everything. That's okay. You, maybe you don't know that. I don't, you understand, it, for us to not agree on everything, it's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. It's okay, but what is not okay, what is absolutely not okay, is the moment you allow your opinions and positions and perspectives to come between you and other members of the same body of Christ that you belong to, to the point that you break fellowship with the other parts of the same body of Christ. You're treading in territory when you do that, that Jesus and everyone who wrote after him says is a very dangerous place. For you to be spiritually, it's like you're cutting off your own hand or your own foot. Why would you do that? Jesus says this, this is not a good place for you to be. Why? Because a house divided cannot stand. A house divided is incapable of testifying to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the rest of the world because we cannot love the world if we cannot love each other first. And if we cannot love each other, then we cannot love God, you cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of his church that, that is scripturally incompatible. You cannot have a high view of Christ and a low view of the church. Jesus died for the church. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. 1 John 4.20 it's exactly why Paul says to Titus, says for the person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Treat him as a tax collector and a Gentile, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. Why is he self-condemned? Because you cannot love Christ while you're hating on your brother or sister in Christ. Joni Erickson Tata said, believers are never told to become one. We already are one. And are expected to act like it. Let's finish the letter, verse 12, to the end. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. So in typical fashion for first century letters, Paul closes with a reference to his upcoming travel plans and with greetings to his fellow workers as well. And he explains to Titus that he's sending in the next wave of workers to Crete for Titus to pass the baton to so they can continue to strengthen the churches there and to bring things into order, uh, which he talked about in earlier chapters. And then also to free up Titus to be able to meet back up with Paul at Nicopolis. Nicopolis was a port city in Epirus. Uh, as an interesting side note, it was founded by Augustus after his victory over Antony and uh, Cleopatra in 31 BC. It was about 200 miles northwest of Athens, and it was about 300 miles, really about 310 miles from Crete, which was a really uh, long way to travel in the first century. So Paul is lining things up for Titus to be able to leave Crete by winter time, Making sure, however, that before he leaves, everything is sort of lined up for the churches in Crete to be able to take care of each other after Titus leaves. So Paul says, look, you have this letter that will continue to be used in, in instruction to the churches as it circulates through them. You will have established at that point some new leaders in the church by the time you leave, which he instructed him to do early on. Uh, we talked about that in those previous chapters. And then Paul says, I'm also sending in some fresh workers as well. All of this is to help ensure that the churches have what they need to care for one another because that's what hasn't been happening. So we're going to fix things. Hopefully we're going to change uh, the chemistry here so that the church will begin to care for one another and not be, Paul says, unfruitful, which in the original Greek means useless, literally. In other words, if we, if we can't properly care for each other in the church, then we can't properly care for anything. And so according to Paul, the church then becomes useless. 
So Paul gives the churches everything that he can to help them thrive as best workers, letters of instruction, committed leadership, sound doctrine, a solid plan for growth and maturity. And yet still he's warning them not to become useless. Because although this sounds really good and complete, like he's sort of uh, tying things off and, and this is going to work out great, easy peasy. Well, the reality of implementing everything that Paul has been laying out in this letter to Titus in all of the churches across all of Crete, which were a total mess. Okay, the reality is this is a daunting task and Paul knows it, right? This is not only going to require a tremendous amount of dedication and hard work on the part of church leadership and all the resources he's sending, but it's also going to require a tremendous commitment from the rest of the church because of how far these churches had devolved into disunity and injustice between them. I mean, just go back and read the first two chapters if you weren't here, and it becomes very clear very quickly that there were great injustices being perpetrated against the church from within the church. Right, to the point that Paul says in chapter 1, entire families are being torn apart because of what was happening in the churches there. And it couldn't matter any more to the church today because of the level of disunity that I believe we're seeing not only in the world but in the church itself. I mean, at least across America, the church I'm most familiar with. As we see the level of dissension and division, separation happening in our country, it seems the church in many ways, is following suit that ought not be. So Paul closes out this letter by explaining that if the church is going to survive, the people themselves are going to have to fight for justice within the church itself. Because listen, what's been going on there won't be fixed by simply reading a letter or appointing new pastors, or starting new programs, or sending more workers. No, it's actually much deeper than that. The people themselves are going to have to commit themselves to fruitfulness, to spiritual growth, to mutual submission and holiness, to the word of God, to unity, and to righteousness, just living, all of which Paul spelled out throughout this letter, which is also going to require a lot of mending of relationships that have been damaged and broken. Otherwise, all of this that Paul says, all of this time and energy, all this we're doing here, this, the resources, everything that goes into this, it's useless. It's like an apple tree that doesn't produce apples. What's the point? You just cut it up and burn it. Use it for firewood. An apple tree that refuses to produce apples is useless. So is the church that refuses to produce good spiritual fruit. What does that look like? It's a lot of people doing what is right by each other, doing what is just, in fact, what is needed in the church. And so Paul closes the letter by, by saying, look, make sure they learn to devote themselves to good works, to the just treatment of everyone so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful, not be useless. In other words, if, if you don't want the church to become useless, Titus, then you're going to have to fight for unity among yourselves and justice for everyone because the church isn't going to fix itself. You're going to have to fight for it. And of course, we all know as believers that, that God is just, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Justice is actually a part of his character, and he exercises that justice on behalf of his people, not because uh, we've earned it or could ever be good enough on our own to deserve it, but simply because of who he is, a just and loving and forgiving God. Yet, look, because God is just, justice must be done. So our sin had to be paid for. So he sent his perfect and sinless son, Jesus Christ, to die for us in our place so that through the ultimate injustice, Jesus crucified on a cross, through the ultimate injustice, justice was served. And, and look, there isn't a human soul that ever has been or ever will be who could do what Jesus did because none of us is just or justified without Christ. Meaning God's justice for his people rests in his character, not ours. And yet we're supposed to model his character in ours. So then 
Why do we feel we're sometimes justified in withholding, for instance, forgiveness from someone who may not deserve it? When a just God has forgiven us, even though we didn't deserve it. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, Paul said, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against the other, you're free to quit the church and go find another one that agrees with you more. Oh, sorry, it's not what it said. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, call up your friend on the phone and talk to them about what that person did to you. Well, that's not what it says either. I didn't write this. He says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. In other words, because God's character is to offer us forgiveness even though we don't deserve it, we are to also offer forgiveness to others who don't deserve it. You know what that is? That is just treatment. It's not what we think of when we think of justice. But forgiving someone who doesn't deserve it, who isn't asking for it, who has hurt you, forgiving them just like Jesus forgave you, that's justice. God's justice was ultimately expressed through the cross. His justice was satisfied in the crucifixion of the Christ, which means his justice was satisfied by us getting exactly what uh, we did not deserve. Right? That's not getting what we did deserve. And so because he forgave us, even though we didn't deserve it, he requires us to forgive others even when they don't deserve it. That may not seem just to us, I understand but justice originates in God's character, not ours. And it's satisfied. Justice is satisfied in what Christ did, not in what we do. Again, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans 3, 23 through 26. It's pretty clear. By the way, the word justified here in the Greek means to be rendered innocent or righteous, forgiven, washed clean. So all who are justified, made righteous, forgiven, made clean, are justified because he is just, because he is righteous. It all comes from him because we're not righteous without him, which means we have no right to withhold from others that which he did not withhold from us. But listen, so much of our behavior that we think is just is actually nothing more than pride Jealousy and bitterness all dressed up in self-righteousness. Okay, but we, we, we cannot hold back forgiveness when we've been hurt or offended. We, we cannot carry those offenses around with us as if by our own merit we're somehow justified in withholding forgiveness when we're hurt by others. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a club that every single one of us is a member of. No exceptions, no exemptions, no special cases. Guilty down to the last man. Every one of us who's justified by faith in Christ is so justified only because of Christ, which means we are required then to reflect his character by offering to others what he offered to us. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to stop withholding compassionate hearts toward other people. Listen, even when they don't deserve it. We cannot withhold kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, especially within the church. Church. 
Now, look, God will see to it that justice is done on our behalf whenever, however, wherever he chooses. Our job is to bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven us. So also we must forgive. Because again, you can win arguments all day long. You can debate about everything going on in the world today with other believers. But no matter how convincing or impenetrable your arguments may be, if you don't have a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and forgiveness, if you don't radiate the character of Christ in everything you say and do, in how you live your life, then your very best arguments will fall on deaf ears. Nobody's listening. God is just... And therefore our justifier, which means we cannot withhold from others what he did not withhold from us. You see, justice isn't just something that God does. It's actually a part of who God is. Justice is a part of his very nature, which means it must now be a part of ours. So I'm simply asking you, I'm asking you to consider not just your opinions and positions and perspectives about everything happening in our world today, but to consider your responsibility to other people today, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ who may not always share the same opinions and positions and perspectives about everything happening in our world today as you. Because look, you may be right and they may be wrong. You may well be right and they may well be wrong. And you can fight that fight and you can win that battle and you can lose the war. Which is exactly what the enemy wants because if he can keep us fixated on fighting with each other then we become useless at fighting against him the real battle that we've been called to fight. Storming the gates of hell instead of beating each other up. So look, Regardless of which side of the argument you land on, I mean it. I don't care. Whatever side of the argument you land on, if you post more on social media about a vaccine and what it can do to you or for you than you post about Jesus and what he can do to you or for you, you may be fighting the wrong battle. Regardless of which side you land on. Listen, if you spend more time talking about politics than you do about the gospel, you may be fighting the wrong battle. You understand I'm saying this because I love you. I I love the church. If you spend more time trying to win arguments for your side than you do winning hearts for Christ, you are fighting the wrong battle. Because God has called us to fight. He's called us to fight for unity and justice within the church. Because listen, the gates of hell cannot withstand a church that is unified and justified in Christ. And that is the battle I am ready to fight. Let's pray.